Okay, here we are. We're doing Immunology 7 in our series. And this lesson will discuss hypersensitivity. Well, it's a very deep subject. And as we go through here, you're going to learn there are basically four types. They're numbered Roman numeral 1, 2, 3, 4. You'll see that in tables. Of course, I've got a couple tables. But to learn this, you need to know what uh, mediates the hypersensitivity. And we'll, we'll do it. I just wanted to show you this cat. I'll even make sure it's large enough. This would be a hypersensitivity. This cat happens to be allergic to mosquito bites. And that's what happened. You know, the nose on cats has uh, less hair. It's very readily, it's a readily available target for mosquitoes. And this poor little kitty has developed a hypersensitivity to mosquito bites. As you know, if your pets don't have a sensitivity, a mosquito bite might result in a little swelling, but nothing like this. So, before we go into the details of the four types, we need to know that it's basically a genetic problem. And here we can uh, highlight atopic individuals. Sometimes you'll see this word, it's atopy, is one way to pronounce it. I always like the atopic individuals. This means that they generate an exaggerated immune response. So it tends to be somewhat genetic. And let me scroll across here a definition that I think is very good. And you'll, some of this will disappear, but I'll go slow. It's a genetic tendency to develop allergic diseases. And then they give some examples, allergic rhinitis, asthma, or atopic dermatitis. Atopy is typically associated with a heightened or you could say exaggerated or overreacting immune responses to common allergens, uh, especially inhaled allergens and food allergens. We're going to find out we have some other tables that kind of list some of the specifics of this condition, but it's a genetic predisposition, let's put it that way. So it runs in family lines, not only for our pets, but our us humans as well. So if you have a relative or a parent, for example, that had hay fever, you're more likely to have hay fever than maybe the rest of the population. Okay, we're working our way up to some specific tables, but again, I'd like to find you some graphics that talk about uh, these conditions in general. And I'm going to enlarge this. And of course, you can pause it. And let me just enlarge this top. And this is talking about dogs and common allergen or allergy triggers. And I like how they make a point. There's this genetic tendency. They say abnormal immune reactions. I'd like to think of it as overreactive or exaggerated. There's nothing, you know, it's just more reaction than normal. So let me scroll this, enlarge, not enlarge it, but move it so you can read it, you can pause it, and uh, that saves me time and uh, file size. Okay, so now I'm going to move that out of the way, and I'm just going to show you a couple examples, a couple of more examples. Some I know the history and some I don't. This happens to be a dog with flea bite dermatitis. Remember the cat had basically mosquito bite dermatitis. This is flea bite dermatitis. And then sometimes you can get lump formation. I cannot remember what this dog was allergic to, but there's many ways that these reactions occur, of course, you need to work with a veterinarian if you have a dog or cat or other pet that's allergic, but that's often, often tough to diagnose, but you have to try.
and I do like to show you a lot of graphics because um, the more the better actually okay so now here's some allergic reactions and it talks about now this is for humans but you know there's poisonous plants we're gonna get into the table um, to categorize them one through four but plants can cause problems animal scratches pollen of course latex gloves now some people have developed allergies to latex bee stings uh, medication you should realize there's a you know might be allergic to a certain medicine you know penicillin is a very interesting one but you don't usually ingest penicillin but I guess there are penicillin penicillin tablets so yes I guess that's true nuts and shellfish you know people are some people are allergic to peanuts or other nuts or fish seafood uh, pollen you can inhale pollen dust uh, animal dander you should know dander is basically the uh, skin flakings and hair off somebody uh, off a pet I'm sorry I used to know somebody that was allergic to rat dander you might say how would they be exposed to rats well a lot of universities have rat colonies where you do research. I remember at Nebraska, I don't know, we had over a thousand or two or three rat, thousand rats that we worked with. Okay, now we're going to start talking about the four types. And I'm going to let you do a lot of reading on your own, which means pause, read. But basically, you can see there's four types. It's a Roman numeral thing. And you should realize that type one through three they tend to be what's called immediate hypersensitivities. They happen within minutes or hours. Type 4 is notable that it's a delayed type hypersensitivity. And like me, I have poison ivy hypersensitivity, and it really takes two or three days to really get a good reaction going. Okay, pause and read, guys. Okay, another beautiful table gives you more information. I'm slowly trying to build up the level of complexity. I'll maybe take a few more minutes with this one. Type 1 reaction, anaphylactic or anaphylaxis. You should know that it happens, you know, in minutes up to 30. And we're going to have uh, some diagrams, but it's basically where an individual makes too much IgE. If you remember, that's an immunoglobulin that sits with its long stem on mast cells. And we're going to find out when allergens bind, and we'll call it cross-linking the antibodies, then these cells are basically floating drug stores, and they release a lot of chemicals, such as histamine, and it causes problems. Uh, smooth, mother, smooth muscle contraction and a vasodilation. Type 2, often called cytotoxic. That's a word that means poisoning cells. It takes a few hours, and we're going to talk about it's mostly IgG and IgM. And again, you can re pause this. Transfusion reactions is a good one where you get the wrong type of blood or an animal gets a wrong type of blood, especially if they've been exposed to it before. And that's maybe something I should say right now. You can't be allergic to something that you've never been exposed to. Now, it takes an initial exposure to make you sensitized, and then the next time you see it, you can have a full-fledged reaction. And of course, sometimes you get exposed to things that you're not aware of, okay? So it's not like, oh, I don't remember ever being exposed to X. Well, you might have been, but you weren't aware of it. Type 3, an immune complex. What that means is there's antibodies and antigens forming together, binding together, and it's a complex. And sometimes just that particle getting someplace can cause a lot of damage. And remember, one through three is immediate, basically is called, within minutes or hours. Delayed type is interesting because there's no antibodies involved here. It's mainly uh, T cells. And it takes days to go to develop this. And I already mentioned poison ivy. Again, I'm going to say, pause, take notes, whatever. Now, this figure is good because it puts pictures to it. And I'm going to get as big as I can. And you can pause it, but I'll just talk about a few things. Okay, type 1. You have this IgE 
sitting with its long stem on a mast cell and also basal fills. The kicker is an allergen cross-links. It's got to bind across two antibodies. And of course, this would happen thousands of times on a cell. That cross-linking is the message to release chemicals. That's the kicker there. Okay, this cytotoxic hypersensitivity is important too. And you can see where it's basically cells that are a problem. Type 3, and we're going to go through these in more detail in a little bit. So I'm, I'm kind of running through these. You can pause it. It's the immune complex sticking someplace. Here's an immune complex. In green, we have the antigen. The antibodies are making a big mass, okay? And then type 4, remember that's delayed, and poison ivy is a great example. It's basically you make angry macrophages that come into the area and destroy tissue. Isn't that a great phrase? An angry macrophage. So now I'm going to try to talk about each one in a little more detail, but the, those tables are great. Okay, and again, you can pause this. It's a little fuzzy, but I think you can still read it. I want to make it as big as possible for you. An animal or person is born with a predisposition to allergies. That's that atopic individual. They get exposed to something. They make a lot more IgE than the rest of us. Okay, and IgE will sit on the mast cell. This is an allergic individual. A non-allergic individual might only have one of these antibodies floating in relative proportions. You know, we're just doing a graphic here. And then, this is a sensitized individual. Now, the next time the person gets exposed to that allergen, and I guess in this case it's a bee sting, the bee sting gives you an allergen. Then you have this cross-linking of the IgE antibodies. And remember, a non-allergic person wouldn't have this many IgEs in this picture, and there wouldn't be cross-linking. Cross-linking, sorry. So then you got the cross-linked IgE, and that's the trigger that releases the chemicals that do the damage or cause the reaction. So, let's see some of the results. Okay, now as the reaction is taking place then, it can either be local or systemic. Now this, this figure talks about systemic. Respiration becomes difficult. Blood pressure drops. Smooth muscles of the bladder and the GI contract. Bronchial constriction. Basically that means air wave, airways are getting smaller. Okay, and then even if you've been watching TV, they talk about those EpiPens or pens with epinephrine. So this is the antidote. Maybe that's a good term I should uh, write here. So there, I magically made antidote appear at the bottom of the screen on the left side there. An antidote is any agent that counteracts, in the broad sense, a poison. So although these reactions you might not say are poisonous but that's the definition of an antidote it's going to like counteract what's happening counteract something bad that's happening so epinephrine is often the antidote for this type 1 type reactions okay so a little more detail on the type 2 hypersensitivity and type 2 is often known as the antibody mediated destruction of cells. There's an antibody involved. Here we've got IgG. This says a normal host cell. Well, you might want to think of this as also being a blood cell that antibodies are binding to. Like, you can go back and refresh yourself on the um, equine neonatal isoerythrolysis, and we talked about the hemolytic disease of the newborn. This could be it. This could be a normal red blood cell inside an animal or a person that ends up being. And if somehow there are antibodies developed against some of these surface molecules, epitopes down here, then when that happens, there are a couple possible sequences. 
So one, you're like, I'm going to name three sequences. One is that complement can be activated and pores can be formed in this innocent host cell or red blood cell. Go back to the isourethrolysis. So isourethrolysis is really a type 2 hypersensitivity, by the way. The other thing that can happen is you can get these phagocytes or other cells that bind to what's called the FC portion of the antibody, and then you have an FC receptor binding to the FC portion. And then this activates this cell to even release like lysozymes or other lytic enzymes that will destroy this cell. Okay. And then a third way is that if it is truly a phagocyte, like a macrophage, it could make the macrophage angry, and this macrophage could phagocytize this normal cell. So it's a little more complicated than type 1. So let me review. You can activate complement. That's one of the possibilities. Or you can make these cytotoxic cells release lytic enzymes. That's two. And three is a macrophage, an angry one, could actually eat this cell. Maybe think of this as a red blood cell. That's one of the most common um, examples of a type 2 hypersensitivity when bl a bad blood transfusions take place or like isourethrolysis because then these antibodies would have come across from colostrum or across the placenta. But like in the foal, we talked about these are mom's antibodies that normally help the foal, but in this case, they're going to recognize the red blood cells and destroy them and cause hemolytic disease of the newborn or isourethrolysis, and you can refresh your memory of that. Okay, this is a little more detail on hypersensitivity type 3. We're still talking about antibodies playing a large role. And in fact, in 1, 2, and 3 hypersensitivities, antibodies play a large role. In type 3, we have immune complexes and that means antibodies binding to antigen, antigen, and they deposit. They're big enough that they're going to like deposit themselves in blood vessels or the glomerulus. Remember, glomeruli is the plural for glomerulus, the functional unit of the kidney. Well, just the physical presence can be a problem, and also they can activate complement. Because remember, anytime antibodies bind to something, complement can be activated and you lead to damage in the nephrons for example the glomerulus in particular and for example arthritis is another example when you get these complexes depositing in joints okay and here's some examples and a little review of type 3 hypersensitivities uh, remember, it's antigen and antibody complexes, and it depends on where they deposit themselves. If they're around small blood vessels, that's a problem because what happens is neutrophils try to come into the tissue and then destroy the complex, phagocytize it or release lytic enzymes. So that's a problem when these complexes are depositing. It's also known as an arthritis reaction when it happens in a local area. Like sometimes you can inject something and then get a reaction at that point. And it's again an antigen antibody complex. There's inflammatory molecules released and you know that's gonna cause fluid to leak from the blood vessels. And again, like I just said, infiltration with neutrophils they're going to try to phagocytize and destroy the complexes. So they're kind of brainless. They're like, they see this complex and they're going to work on it. And they might uh, destroy some of the local blood supply, right? Farmer's lung is an example of the farmers working with moldy hay. They inhale the products of that mold and then that can cause a local reaction. Okay, finally, let's talk a little more about the type 4 reactions. Of course, this is the cell-mediated type of hypersensitivity. The 1 through 3 were 
basically antibodies were important. In type 4, antibodies really don't play a role directly. And let me get my laser pointer here. Some classical examples here of this delayed type hypersensitivity, right? Remember, it takes hours, like 24, 36 hours to do this. Uh, the tuberculin skin test is a react is an example of this. Contact dermatitis. They've got like two metals, nickel and chrome, but remember poison ivy and poison oak would be great examples of this reaction. And then also when tissues that are transplanted from some donor to a recipient, when they're rejected, they're often rejected here by this type 4 reaction that takes place over time. Let me move in some words that I want to make sure we understand for type 4 hypersensitivity. Usually the first thing that happens is you get these T cells, which are called delayed type hypersensitivity T cells, uh, DTH T cells, that come into the area and interact with the antigen. Let's say it's um, the poison ivy. Then these cells, maybe I'll put that up here, these T cells, a special class of T cells, some people think it's a subclass of T helper cells. They're delayed type hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity T cells, sorry. They come into the area, interact, and they release chemicals. Sometimes they're called cytokines. Um, think of it as releasing a lot of chemicals. And those chemicals over time now will attract macrophages. It takes a while to attract macrophages because they're not nearly as numerous as neutrophils. If you recall in the blood, if you had to say what's the most prevalent phagocytic cell in the blood, you would say neutrophils. But this is going to be mediated more by macrophages that come in, they get kind of angry, and they're going to do tissue damage, basically irreversible irreversible tissue damage. And I myself have an allergy to poison ivy, so I know after a time, if I get itchy and red and bubbles start forming, I'm undergoing the type 4 hypersensitivity. Finally, here's a list of those beautiful illustrations. I'll try to make it as large as possible. Couldn't do it without these beautiful illustrations.